There we started uh, writing on philosophy of language and philosophy of mind. He organized with Crispin Wright and Cynthia MacDonald this book, Knowing Our Own Minds. It's a great book and has uh, also a great paper written by Barry. Um, and in the last, I think, decade, Barry started to research and write about uh, theories of perception, and uh, he, he has also a book organized about philosophy of wine, and has written on taste and smell, and today he will uh, talk about smell also and how smell, what's the role of smell in consciousness. And in the evening, he, we will change a little bit the subject to the multisensory perception of art. So we will be together the whole day. And I want to thank you very much, Barry, to be here with us. You are a great friend, and also we are always very interested in all what you are, are doing and researching. Thank you very much. Sophia, thank you very much. Um, it's great pleasure and honor to be invited back to Unisinos, and thank you for coming. Uh, I know it's hard work that you have to listen to me speaking in English. <clears throat> that means you're doing twice as much work as I'm doing, because you're having to think and translate. So I want you to uh, ask questions at any time during the talk. If there's something that comes to mind, just, just put your hand up and we'll, we'll stop for questions. And if you want me to say something, explain it again clearly, then I'll do that. <clears throat> So thank you to Sofia, thank you to Unisinos, thanks to all of you. Sofia asked me to explain how, as a philosopher, I came to be working with sensory science and writing and, and doing bits of sensory science. And it's really because, as a philosopher of mind, I was studying perception. And most philosophers, when they study perception, they just study vision. And in fact, when you read them, they say, I'm going to give you a theory of perception. Imagine that you're looking at a tomato and they just deal with vision, nothing but vision. And then they often say, uh, we just must make minor modifications, a few adjustments to get a theory of smell and touch and, and hearing and so on. And I was suspicious of that. I thought we need to look at these other senses. In particular, we need to look at what Kant and Aquinas called the lower senses. Now, the lower senses of touch, taste, and smell are lower because they're bodily senses. So they were not very approved of by the church because they reminded us of bodily sensations, whereas vision and audition were supposed to take us high into the uh, nature of independent reality I think that's a very bad distinction. I think we need a distinction between distal and proximal senses, senses that are near and senses that are, give you information that's far. But smell and taste, I think, are also objective senses. They're picking up on features of the environment, things you interact with, things you need to know. And it would be a very strange thing if our sense of sight and hearing and touch are all to put us in touch with the world. They're to make us know our environment and behave in our environment. It would be very strange if, when it came to taste, the brain just says, do what you want. It doesn't matter about anything objective. Just, just do what you want. Your other senses are there to give you information about the environment. So is taste. So is smell. They're important, as I hope to convince you. So I, I thought I wanted to learn something about the other senses. And, as Sophia mentioned, I also had a, a personal interest in wine. And I wrote a little bit about wine. I even wrote about Brazilian wine. 
And um, this, this meant that I was talking to people about how you taste wine and what you taste. And then I asked, how does taste work? And when I talked to colleagues in neuroscience and psychology, they explained, oh, it's very complicated. There's all sorts of senses that are involved. There's taste, there's smell, there's touch, the trigeminal nerve, all sorts of things. And then I realized what we call taste is not a single sense, it's multi-sensory. And when I realized that multi-sensory perception wasn't the exception, it's the rule, it's the way all of our senses work. So right now, as you're seeing me and hearing me, and maybe even tasting a residual bit of sushi in your mouth, uh, all of that is going on in a single unified conscious space. It's not as though your consciousness divides it up into separate parcels. You don't say, now I see, now I hear, now I touch. They're all part of a single experience, unified experience. So most of our experience, almost all our experience, is multisensory. It's never, it's very difficult to get purely unisensory experiences, very difficult. So I started to research uh, the nature of tasting, the nature of multisensory perception of flavor in food and in wine. And then I got very interested in smell. And I think smell is one of the most neglected of the senses. It's the one that people pay almost no attention to at all. So I want to try to change that and change your mind. So I'm asking about the role of smell in consciousness. Now, when we talk about the role of smell in consciousness, is that one role or many? And I'm going to suggest there are many roles it plays. It's not just a single thing that it does. But here is the, here's the prevailing view. Most, most sensory scientists, neuroscientists, and philosophers, they often have this minimal, minimalist approach. They say there's a limited role for olfaction in conscious daily life. Unless we smell something, overpowering, which captures our attention. Oh, what's that? Or unless we deliberately sniff at something. Unless we do that, we don't have experiences of smell. So they say smell is only there occasionally. It's not really very present. So you can have attention capture when you smell something disgusting. Captures your attention. You know, oof, terrible. And you can see the automatic facial recognition. Or there can be something lovely that captures your attention. It doesn't always have to be disgusting. You think, ah, oh, that's wonderful. That's what we're all going to have later. Is that right? We're, yeah. <laughs> but you can also direct your attention. You can be consciously deciding to focus your attention. What is, what is that aroma? What am I getting here? So you try to do it. OK. But there's evidence of people's neglect of their sense of smell. And quite often, if you ask people famously, if you had to give up one of your senses, which one would you give up? Never give up my sight. Don't want to lose my hearing. I couldn't hear music anymore. So they say, oh, sense of smell. And a lot of people have said that, including this chap. So here's Kant, who says, which organic sense is the most ungrateful and also seems the most dispensable, the sense of smell? It does not pay to cultivate it or refine it at all in order to enjoy, for there are more disgusting objects than pleasant ones, especially in crowded places. And even when we come across something fragrant, the pleasure coming from the sense of smell is fleeting and transient. So Kant thinks it's, it's an almost negligible part of our conscious lives. It doesn't really matter. You could live without it, and you could live without it, and your life would be just as good, in fact, he thinks, better. But we know that's not true. We know now, from lots of empirical studies, and this is charted uh, by Thomas Hummel and his lab in Dresden in Germany, who's one of the major smell experts. Hummel talks about and has done lots of studies over time of people who lose their sense of smell. And when they lose their sense of smell, they often become very depressed their emotions seem flat. They talk about feeling as though they're cut off from the world, as though they're living behind glass. 
uh, none of the things they know, the people, the places, the objects that they knew seem familiar anymore. So their quality of life is really bad. Also, as we'll see later, it means they don't get as much flavor from their food. And so they stop eating or they eat many things that are just sweet or salty, very bad for the health. So it's not true that living without your sense of smell is going to be good. In fact, when people suffer this, they now realize how important it was, especially because smell is connected to the emotions, as we'll see, very strongly connected to the emotions. And that's for a physiological reason. So your sense of smell has got the shortest relay in the brain between receptors and uh, uh, cortex. It's just one relay from the receptors inside your nose through the cribriform plate to the, the olfactory bulb here, just, just behind the nose. And from there, signals go from the olfactory bulb to the amygdala in the center of the brain, which is a center for, very primitive center for emotion and memory. And every other sense is first on a relay through the thalamus before it gets to the amygdala. But your sense of smell goes directly to the amygdala. It's one of the, the fastest routes to emotional reaction. And that's probably because every animal, every vertebrate and, and lots of non-vertebrates, they use the sense of smell as, an, as a danger warning, as a warning about predators, as a warning about uh, danger in the environment, food sources, mate selection, all of that. So the question is, are we really different or are we just like that? We don't know that we are. So let's see. <clears throat> so why do people think that, they, that the sense of smell is unimportant? Probably because humans say they don't rely on it. And it's very interesting. Because we're a species who are now standing on two legs instead of on all fours, if we were on the ground, we might be sniffing for scent. But because we stand upright, we're very, the nose is very far from the ground, and we use our eyes to look further because we're upright. So we've come to rely on vision, and to take vision to be the supreme sense for knowing where we are for navigating the environment. But also people believe, most of us believe, that humans have got a very poor sense of smell. Most people think that, oh, humans' sense of smell is much worse than other animals. Is that true? Is that true? Well, it's actually better than we think, our sense of smell. Nothing wrong with our sense of smell, we just don't use it. But when you actually test people, and get them to discriminate in odors, as we'll see, they're fantastically good. We, can we humans can discriminate at least, at least um, over 100,000 odors, maybe, maybe many, many more. In fact, it's very, very difficult for us to take any two odors and not, that are different and not discriminate between them. We can tell the difference. The other thing is humans can, if humans are trained to smell, as people are in wine tasting, in perfumery, in coffee uh, and tea uh, tasting, their abilities become very, very refined. Now, it's not the case they were born with a special capacity. It's the fact that they're using something they didn't use and you can train it. So unlike your other senses, your hearing, your eyesight, it's going to be pretty fixed by the time you're five or six, pretty fixed. But your sense of smell can get better. You can train it, you can improve it by training, by practice, by learning. So, the only the reason why our sense of smell is better than we think is that our sense of smell is actually um, uh, keyed to eating and choosing food that we like, sampling food, deciding between different flavors. So we're going to see how important that is. But look. Why do we not think, why do we not know that our sense of smell is good? Well, there's a paper that just came out in Science recently saying, well, the reason why is because scientists in the 19th century said that we weren't good at smell and that convinced everybody. But, I mean, that's a touching faith in science. They think that scientists are going to convince everybody in the street that they're not good. At, people don't read that much science. 
Ordinary people don't think they're good at smell, not because they've read lots of scientific treatises about it. That's not why they're, they think they're not good at smell. Can't be that. Okay. Um, some people say it's because we can't name odors. So it's very difficult to name smells. You can name colors. It's very easy to teach people red, green, blue, yellow, fine. But you don't have names for smells. What you do have is names for the source of smells, leather, grass, paint, but not for the smell itself. You don't have descriptions of the smell itself. You've got descriptions of the thing that has the smell, but not the smell. So is this part of the problem? Um, well, when you perceive a smell, so if I blindfold you and I give you a smell, suppose I give you the smell of um, a chair in your house, okay? I give you that smell. You might say, oh, it's familiar. What is that? But nothing in the representation of the smell shows you where it came from, okay? Whereas if you look at a visual image, a visual image is always looks like the thing it's a picture of. If I give you a picture of Sophia, then you can see from the photograph, ah, that's the source. It's, it's transparent. But with a smell, it doesn't indicate in the content of the experience what it's the smell of. So the trick, the difficulty is how do you name odors? So if I give you a, an odor to smell and I say, what do you think this is? You might say, hmm, I know that, I know that. You're still struggling to describe it. But it's not because there's some special disconnect between smell and names. It's because there's a disconnect between smell and the sources. As soon as you know the source, you've got the name. Abakashi, mint, okay, grass, it's fine. So, <clears throat> do we have words? A lot of linguists have said we don't have words for names. In fact, they're famously linguists who say, unlike other cultures, some cultures have got words for uh, smells, but, but in the West, we don't really have that. I think that's not true. <clears throat> So this is, in English, you've got at least these are words for smells, not for the source, for the smells. Acrid, pungent, putrid, fragrant, musty, whiffy, pongy, foul, niffy, nippy, tangy, intoxicating, aromatic, stale, fresh, noxious. That's okay. I mean, it's not as many as colors, but it's quite a lot. Scots vernacular. Fusty, rank, minging, boufing. Okay, so each, each part of English has got not only the top ones, but it's got its own set. So it'd be really interesting, and I'd like you between now and when we break to think how many words you have in Portuguese, just for the smell itself, for the quality of the smell, not the name of a, a source, but for the quality. Just have a think about that. I'd, I'd really like to know. It's always said to me that in Portuguese, you have more words for emotion than we have in English. Maybe right, maybe not. But that would be interesting if the link between smell and emotion is kind of strong. I wonder if you've also got more words for smell, but I'll need to know. <clears throat> so, how good is human olfaction? Well, you can detect it. We have a kit called Sniffin Sticks, which were 32 or 40 little pens, and you take the top off, like the pens you write on the screen, you smell them, and we do three tests. One test is to see how good is your detection of a smell. So we take you from something that you say has no smell at all, and we gradually give you stronger and stronger concentration, and as soon as you say, ah oh, yeah, that's, that's got a smell, then we can set where your threshold is. Then we give you discrimination tasks. So we give you three pens to smell. <laughs> Which one is the odd one out? Two of them are the same, one is different. And then finally, we give you 16 pens of everyday odors. A lot of them are odors you come across every day. And we ask you, can you name them? And you get a score, you get a score that's an amalgam of your threshold, your discrimination, and your identification, TDI. 
And we have, in, in my lab in London, we have a, a, a leaderboard. Everybody who comes in, we try to test them, and we see who's at the top. And so far, it's my personal, my project administrator, uh, Nisha Patel. And she said, and this will matter later, she said, oh, I'm hopeless at smell. She's not. She's one of the best. So we don't always know how good we are, but we can test. We can find out. OK. So the other thing is, even if you can't, even if you can't name smells, you can do rather a lot. If I give you a smell, um, I think I've got some here. I don't know. I always manage to get these past security at airports. I'm impressed with the Norwegians. They always find it, but nobody else does. I'll, I'll see if I can find it later. So a little bottle, and I'll get you to smell. Quite often, people will say, um, oh, that's familiar. I recognize that. In fact, that's one of the things you can tell me almost straight away. If I give you something to smell, you can tell me I've smelled that before or not. So even though you might not be able to name it, your brain has already decided, yeah, I've, I've encountered that before. I've got that. So there's lots of things we can assess. Let me just show you some of them. So here's some of the things you can do without language. You can detect whether there is an odor. Is there something there or not? You can discriminate between two odors, same or different. You can recognize an odor as familiar. You can also classify an odor. If I give you an odor, I can say, is that something edible or inedible? And you know. No, that's, you wouldn't eat something that smells like that. Yeah, that smells like something I would eat. You, you've got the hedonic valence. Is that a pleasant smell? Is it unpleasant? You've got that. You've got these categories that you can use fruity or floral, like a flower. It's metallic, like a metal. It's like some medicine. It's, it's like perfume. You can also identify, ah, it's that odor again. It's the same one. I've had that before. You can describe them as uh, being rather stale. The, the, the smell is deteriorating, or the smell is intoxicating. And then sometimes you can name violet, rose, pineapple. And of course, we've got scientific names for these odors because we can identify the molecules. You can say that's an aldehyde, or an ester, or a terpene, an alcohol. We've got um, cis-3-hexanol, if I gave you it to smell, is cut grass. Everybody can get that. Usually you smell and you say, oh yeah, that's when grass has just been cut. That's cis 3 hexanol. So there's a, a lot of information about smell, lots of it. And the fact is that smell plays a huge amount, does a huge amount of work in our lives, even though we don't recognize it does. So in our cognitive lives, our emotional lives, our behavior, kin recognition. If we take the t-shirts of people related to you and we tell them not to wash, they just wear a t-shirt with no soap, for a day or two, and I give you hundreds of those t-shirts, you can tell which ones by smelling are family members. You're very good at that. Didn't know you could, but you're very good at that, okay? Emotion recognition. You can tell whether a t-shirt that's got some sweat on it is the t-shirt that somebody's worn when they were excited and happy or when they were afraid and fearful. So if we put people on roller coasters and they're afraid of them, and we put other people through some exciting sports event and they're excited, you can sniff and say, yeah, that's fear, that's... Again, you didn't know you could do that, but it means that when you're dealing with people, you can actually pick up chemo signaling. You're sending out signals from, from the sweat in the body and the brain of the other person's picking it up. I remember when I was young, people used to say, a dog can smell fear, and you thought it was something miraculous. But you can, but so can you. You just don't pay any attention to it, or else you're not conscious of it, but you do that. Here's another emotional thing. Beautiful work by Noam Sobel and his colleagues in uh, the Hebrew University. He has discovered that there's an odor in women's tears that reduces men's libido, reduces their sexual desire. It's incredible, right? So <laughs> who knew? Who knew? Yeah. So when, when men are not, I mean, it's, it, it's got a funny side and then a non-funny side. When men are not deterred by women crying and maybe commit sexual crimes, there's just a wonder whether they don't actually process the smell. 
They haven't been tested for their sense of smell, but it's, it's interesting to find out. Danger detection. So can you detect whether there's fire or whether there's something in the environment that's threatening? Again, we are good at telling whether there is without knowing how we do it. Mate selection. This is funny. It turns out that you are attracted. You're attracted to people whose odor, body odor, tells you that their immune system is further away from yours than closer. So you've got the major histocompatibility complex, which is, is one of the things responsible in your immune system, genetically determined, for de developing your sweat odor. Your odor in your body depends on your genes, depends on what you eat, and depends on the bacteria on you. That's it. But it turns out that we are attracted to people who smell of, of genes that indicate their immune system is different from ours, which is good because then there's a chance of you having more immunity, your offspring will have more immunity, you will be breeding more successfully. And have you never had the experience of thinking that person's very nice, they're very lovely and, you know, but they just smell wrong. There's nothing I can do. If, they, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And on the other hand, maybe there are people who you've met and you've said, wow, they're, they're really lovely and you don't know why. It might be love at first smell. It might be the smell just turns you on. You didn't know it did. Okay. So this is, this is an important result. And of course, finally, food selection, that we actually are able to choose which foods we like and dislike. It's mainly due to the sense of smell. Mainly that's what's, what's determining it. So that's a huge part of what's going on. Now, again, it's good to show uh, that our sense of smell is better than we thought. So here's Noam Sobel again. He wanted to know, people say dogs are very good at sniffing tracks. And he wanted to know whether his undergraduates are good at that too. So this is an experiment he did in Berkeley in the park. So he laid a chocolate trail. And here's, there's a chocolate trail. And the, this is the line uh, of the this is the line of the chocolate trail. And he, got, he blindfolded the undergraduates, and they're on all fours, and they're sniffing. And they eventually get, they take longer time than dogs. This is the line the dog takes. <laughs> it's pretty straight. So they have to do an awful lot of guesswork, but they get there. So we are actually able to do what dogs do. We just, we just don't do it. We don't practice it. We don't use it. But we're able to do it. OK. So it's better than we think. So why don't we know this? So the, the claim by Sobel and his colleague Sela is that it's because it's unconscious. So smell is important for mate selection. It's, it's important for detecting danger, for reading chemical signals of emotion. But all of that's going on unconsciously, below the radar. Of course, it will have an effect on our consciousness, but we don't, we, we're not conscious of it. That's, that's one of the claims. Okay, so here's, here's what they say. We suggest here that due to a form of olfactory change blindness, olfactory stimuli are less prone to attract attention, and therefore humans have poor awareness of the olfactory environment. So what do they mean by change blindness? What they mean is, have you, have you seen these experiments on change blindness where you're shown a picture, I should have put one in my slides. You're shown a picture, and then it flashes, and then you're shown another picture, and you say, what's the difference between these two pictures? And you can't see it. You see a picture with an airplane, and then it flashes, and then you see the airplane again, and you, s you say, something has changed. Can you see? I can't see, I can't see it. And very often, there's a big difference, like an engine is missing, or something that was in the scene is taken out. But what matters is, you have to put the flashes in between. Flash suppression matters. This is attentional blink. So when people are looking, and then you distract the visual system, and then you give them more information, you can't do the direct comparison. So he thinks it's because there's a discontinuity in sniffing. So you go, and then you have to breathe out. And then you go, and you breathe again. There's a gap. And he thinks that gap means you don't keep continuity to be able to recognize odors. So they don't capture our attention nearly as much. 
So he says, olfactory awareness is minimal, though we have sub-attentive mechanisms allowing subliminal smells a profound influence on human behavior and perception. Could it be that odorants that humans are unaware of continuously shape their behavior? So he thinks they're having an effect on us, but one that we don't recognize. We just don't notice it. We don't see it. Okay. So now we've got a couple of options to consider, and this is really what I want to discuss. I want to say, which of these two views is right? So here are two views. One view is olfaction is largely unconscious, but not noti oh, sorry, olfaction is largely conscious that smell, we're conscious of smell, but it's not noticed or recognized. It's at a very low level of consciousness, but we're actually conscious. It's just we don't attend to it, we don't think about it. And the other view is that olfaction occurs largely outside of consciousness, but has a effect, conditions what happens inside consciousness. So could hypothesis one be true? Could we actually be always conscious of smell, but we don't, we're not aware of that, or we don't pay attention to it? Or could it be that it's unconscious? Well, many people think it's unconscious. Here's um, Andreas Keller and colleagues, and David Rosenthal. Most of olfaction must be unconscious. Strong claim, no argument. Um, difference between the ubiquitous non-conscious processing and the sporadic appearing in consciousness is due to varying thresholds, con uh, context dependence, all of which makes it hard to decide when something is in and out of consciousness. So these guys think we only get conscious, it only breaks through, smell only breaks through into consciousness when something major happens or when we make an effort to bring it to consciousness. So is it only when we sniff at odors? Is it only like this? that consciousness gives us a sense of smell. Or this, from this lab in Germany. <laughs> Is it only when we really make the effort, otherwise it's all unconscious? Well, I don't think we should accept that. I think consciousness can be at work. Smell can be at work in consciousness without us noticing it. We smell because we breathe, as J.J. Gibson said. We're not dogs. We don't have to go around going, <laughs> making that conscious effort. Merely breathing in and breathing out will activate our sense of smell. So we are breathing all the time, so you can't really turn smell off. It's always at work. It's always at work. Okay? You can close your eyes, you can turn off vision, but you can't really turn off smell. So normally olfaction is always at work. And here's a quote from Ep Koster. We have a constant bombardment of olfactory receptor neurons by thousands of volatile com uh, compounds, and that's sufficient for smelling. It doesn't depend on sniffing. All the time, odors are coming to your nose, very complex odors. The air is full of molecules and compounds that are volatile and that you can smell, and they're constantly bombarding you, okay? But it's neglected because it's constant, because smell is always there. It's, a, it's like a, a noise, a hum in the background of the air conditioning. So we may not have listened to the air conditioning for a while, but if we stop now, we hear it. And because it's there, your brain tends to stop paying attention to it. The question is, does it stop paying attention by dropping it out of consciousness, or does it leave it in, but just as a background? And that's what I'm interested in here. Okay. So, you could say it's hidden because it's constant. It's a background to experience. A bit like your sense of balance. So people don't notice their sense of balance is always on. You notice when it's turned off. If you suddenly lost the workings of your vestibular system, the room will be spinning. The ear, the ear canals you have that tell you whether you're moving forward or backwards or up or down or to the side, that gives you a sense of balance. In fact, right now, the fluid in your ears is at work because of gravity. If we take you into, uh, into orbit, 
uh, into zero gravity and we switch off the vestibular system, you have a feeling of spinning in free form. And it's a well-kept secret that most astronauts are sick in space. Most of them throw up. Quite a lot of them throw up. So they're not able to cope with that funny feeling because they're not, they're not built to have it. Our ears are built to be this environment. But because we're feeling the force of gravity now, it's so constant that we don't notice it. You'll only notice it when it gets switched off. And I can, do, I can switch it off, by the way. Uh, we know this. If you inject ice-cold water into just one ear, right into the ear canal, you turn off the vestibular system, and now you feel that everything's spinning. It's very unpleasant. Don't try this at home. <laughs> Don't do it to your smaller siblings, please. But, but that's another sense that's working, but we don't notice it's working. It's there. It's always active. Okay, so I think that's true of smell. But because their experiences, because we don't experience smell separately, because it's often a part of the rest of our experience, we don't experience it by itself unless we're paying huge attention, you know, close your eyes and go, what is that? What's that smell? Because we experience it as part of a multi-sensory experience with sight, with sounds, with touch, it doesn't show itself to be so separate and distinct. That may be why we don't notice it. That may be why it, it seems to disappear. Okay? All right. But it does have an impact on your other senses. So I'm going to look at whether hypothesis one could be true, that olfaction is largely conscious but not often noticed. So we have regular conscious experiences of smelling and a lot of them occur when we're eating. In fact, if you think you only smell something when you sniff, like under the armpit when you saw that in the previous <laughs> slide, that's not true. In fact, you're using your sense of smell in tasting and in eating because um, flavor is multisensory. And what we mean by that is that you can't taste something without the involvement of touch and smell and many other senses. Almost everything that we call taste is due to smell. And so some of you have done this before, but I'm going to make you do a little experiment now. So I'm going to give you nose clips that I want you to put on. Okay. So if you take one of these beautiful nose clips, I think there are five there for you guys too. And then I'm going to give you jelly beans. Yes. But you're not to eat the jelly beans, not until we're ready to start. So if you take, take these and pass them to your colleagues. Okay. All right. So, these are, these are nice medical nose clips. I'm not giving you the horrible swimming nose clips. They're painful. These are really nice. I love these. Look, just do that. That's it. Just open them like that. Stick them on. Open them, stick them on, take a selfie, and then I'll give you a jelly bean. <laughs> All right. So, you don't need to wear them till we're ready, but uh, okay. Now we're going to have jelly beans. Yeah. Okay. If you open these and then just ask everyone to take a jelly bean. So what we're going to do, don't eat the jelly bean first. Just, just hold on to it. And we're going to hold it in the hand. And when we're ready, when we're ready, we're going to put the nose clip on. And then we, when we all do it together, we'll put the jelly bean in our mouth with the nose clip attached and chew and chew and chew and you'll tell me what flavor it is. And then after a certain amount of time, I'll ask you to take the nose clip off and see if there's a difference, okay? I'm gonna do this. Now, you need a little bit of breath because it's even better if you chew with your mouth closed. So you need a little bit of breath, but nothing hysterical. We're not deep sea diving. <gasps> just, just a little bit of breath, just enough, okay? Just enough to do it, all right? So, once we've all got jelly beans, 
we will be ready to go. Okay, so hold them in your fingers, no eating, just being ready. And then we'll put the, the nose clips on. You guys have got your beans? Yeah. Just three to go and we're off. Okay. All right. Nose clip on now. The nose clip must be on as if you're putting your head under water, right? It's got to be that, you know, no air is getting up there at all. All right, nose clip's on. Okay. You ready? Take your jelly bean and pop it in your mouth now. Start eating. Okay, start chewing. Now, you'll get some sweetness, but it may be quite difficult to tell what flavor it is. Okay, keep chewing. Now take the nose clip off. Right? And now, now you get the flavor, okay? Now you know whether it's pineapple or cherry or, or cinnamon or whatever, okay. So that's just a very easy demonstration to show you that most of the things you think you're tasting with the tongue, you're not tasting with the tongue at all. It's coming from the nose. It's entirely coming from the nose. Huge amount. People say about 80% of what we call taste is actually due to smell. So. If you think of it, all the tongue can give you is salt, sweet, sour, bitter, umami, savory. But you can taste mango, peach, melon, strawberry, raspberry, banana. You don't have banana receptors on your tongue. That's all due to smell. All of that is due to smell. So smell plays a huge part in eating, okay, and tasting. So here, You've now noticed the contribution that smell makes to your experience of eating something. It's huge. And it's very obvious that it's there when you lose your sense of smell. So people who suddenly lose their sense of smell, sometimes a front-on head accident, if, you, if you're in a car and you get hit here, it shears those little, uh, those little receptor lines that go up to the, to the brain and sometimes your sense of smell is gone, or virus or other head injuries, you can lose your sense of smell. And people will often say, I've lost my sense of taste. They go to the doctor, I can't taste anything. Now, a good doctor will say, put your tongue out, and they'll give them some lemon juice or some sugar or some salt. Can you taste that? Yes. But that's all they can taste. Now they realize so much of what they were experiencing in food was due to smell. But the sense of smell is not the usual sense of smell. So you've got two ways in which smell work. So what we usually think of in smell is where we, we sniff molecules from the environment by breathing in. And you take those molecules up, up to the olfactory receptor sheet, up to the, to the olfactory epithelium here. But the other way that molecules reach the nose is from the mouth. When you chew, you release those odors and they go up the back of the nose this is the retronasal pathway, and they've got the retronasal pathway, and they reach the nose there. Okay. Now, those are two different routes by which breathing in and breathing out, by which smell can, can get to you. And Paul Rosen, psychologist and biologist, talked about olfaction as a dual sense. He said there are two, you've really got two senses of smell, and they've got different evolutionary functions. So one sense of smell, when you inhale, is about detecting things in the environment, danger, food, mates. The other sense of smell is about detecting what you've just eaten and deciding, is it any good? Do I want to swallow that? Should I spit it out? Sometimes when you are putting milk on your cereal, this is a regular student experience, you might smell and think, is the milk okay? Yeah, it's okay, maybe for another day. And then you put it on, and as soon as it's in your mouth, you think, ah. Because now you get the odors reaching the nose, it tells you no, out it goes, okay? So you've got those two different evolutionary functions to, to assess whether anything tastes good and one just to smell things in the environment, okay? But what Rosen was also interested in was the idea that smell was associated, these two senses of smell were associated with two senses of pleasure. There's the pleasure of anticipation so a friend invites you to dinner, and you go into their house, and you say, hmm, that smells good. 
and you're now anticipating what you're going to eat. And then there's the pleasure of reward. When you finally put it in your mouth, you say, ah, that's really great, and now you get the reward. So two different senses of smell. One associated with anticipation, one associated with reward. Now, they can be mismatched. The very same food source, when you smell it outside the head, can be experienced differently than when you have it inside the mouth. There can be a mismatch, even though it's the same molecules going to the same olfactory epithelium. And you get the mismatches like this. Here's a mismatch between anticipation and reward. So the French make these incredibly soft, runny cheeses, a pois or, or camembert, and they keep them until it's al the cheese is almost melting and running off the table and back to the shop. I mean, it's really, and it smells terrible. It smells like a teenager's training shoe, like a tennis shoe. It's like, oh. But when you put it in your mouth, it tastes great. So there's a mismatch between the anticipation where you say, oh, the smell's not so good, but when you eat it, it's great. Coffee, coffee goes the other way. The smell of freshly brewed coffee is lovely. You think, coffee, great. But when you taste it, it's always a bit disappointing. It's never as good as the way you smell, right? It's like, hmm. Now, there are hipsters in New York who are convinced that's because they need to get better equipment, they need to get the water pressure right, they need to buy the beans that have gone through the belly of the wolf, and it'll never work, it'll never work. It's because your two senses of smell do not process those molecules in the same way. Plus, whenever you drink coffee, you, you're stripping 300 of the 800 volatiles off with saliva, so it's never gonna taste the same. Too bad, hipsters. But there's, there's one food, which is an absolute wonder food, where how you experience it by smell in the brain is matched exactly by how it's experienced in the mouth when you're eating it, and that's chocolate. So the odors we get through the nose and the odors we get through the mouth are matched for intensity and pleasure, and that's another reason why chocolate is great, apart from the sugar and the fat and everything else we like. <laughs> It's just another wonder food. Okay. Notice also that we confuse um, taste and smell in the way we talk. So, um, baunia, is that what you call it? Baunia? Baunia, okay. That's okay? Not bad. Vanilla. <laughs> baunia. Okay, so, <laughs> so you take a piece of baunia and you smell, and I say, how does that smell? And people say, it smells sweet, but sweet's a taste, not a smell. And also, if I cut a little bit of it off and I get you to eat it, it's not sweet at all. It's quite bitter. It tastes more like licorice. So what's going on here? Well, what's going on is the fact that we often combine baunia in our foods with sugar, in ice cream, in chocolate, in cakes and biscuits. And for that reason, the brain has learned an association that when it smells that smell, it says, okay, this is going to be sweet. I'm expecting sweet. And so it transfers that property of sweetness onto the smell. It's just a trick, right? And, and because of that, we've got these lovely examples. We, this is benzaldehyde. Uh, Pam Dalton and colleagues did a beautiful experiment, but we could do it with vanilla. So if you give somebody a, a sugar solution, so you give them a sugar solution, and you make sure that there's so little sugar in it that it tastes like water. It's just below threshold, just below threshold. If you give them a few more grams, they'd say, yeah. Milligrams, they'd say, yeah, sweet. Just below threshold. And you give them vanilla to smell, and again, just below threshold. They say, I can't smell anything. And if you just increase the concentration, they would get it. But if you give them vanilla and sugar together, below threshold, they recognize it. And that means that each one boosts the other. There's a very, the brain has learned to put these together. This is called the sweetness enhancement effect, that just smelling something like vanilla actually increases your ability to detect sweetness. It boosts sweetness. Okay. So let's come back to this idea that, that smell is conscious but not noticed. Well, some people could say, yeah, but look, 
okay, you've told me about food and that's interesting, but I still think smell is largely unconscious and that's what people want to say. And so here's Gordon Shepard, who's a neurologist, uh, physiologist, um, now retired from Yale, and he's written a book called Neuroenology. He wrote a book called Neurogastronomy. And then somebody persuaded him to turn to wine and he wrote Neuroenology. And Shepard says this really crazy thing. He says, wine in the mouth causes a new sense, the inner smell that's due to retronasal pathway, true. Of this pathway, we are unconscious, and yet it's responsible for the major part of what we call the taste of wine. He thinks that what smell contributes to food is unconscious. That's not right, because we're very conscious. You were very conscious of what it was contributing when you took the nose clips off. Wow, you're very conscious of what it's contributing. So he's making a mistake. He's making the mistake that the fact we don't recognize that it's smell, that's what we're not conscious of. We're not conscious that that experience of fruitiness, of lemon or, or cinnamon or pineapple, we're not conscious that that is due to smell, but we're definitely conscious of it, whatever it's contributing. That doesn't look right. Okay. Okay. So I think there's a big difference. There's a big difference between how aware we are and our ability to smell. Remember my personal assistant, we tested her, we made her do the, the test with the pens. She said, oh, I can't do this, I'm bad. She wasn't, she was the highest scoring. So there's a difference between our awareness of our abilities and how good we are with our abilities and their mismatches. So subjects' self-beliefs about their olfactory abilities are usually not reliable. When people say, I'm no good at this, it doesn't mean they are no good at it. Secondly, <laughs> there's lots of evidence that people who do notice odors, and especially they notice odors that bother them. They say, oh, I can't stand the smell of this, and oh, it's so annoying that people are using perfumes all the time, and I hate the smell of all that soap they've got in you know, all these uh, washrooms and stuff. These people think they've got a very good sense of smell, but if you test them, they haven't. Very often they haven't. So they're paying attention to smells, but it doesn't mean they've got any special abilities. Quite often they don't. So there's a mismatch. Also, um, olfactory abilities vary from individuals to individuals, and that's, we've got a difficulty in assessing or recognizing it. So you can think there's the sense of smell consciously, and then there's metacognition. Now, metacognition is where you've got cognition that pays attention to, monitors or guides or reflects on what's going on in cognition. And metacognition is now very fashionable. You can't do anything in neuroscience in London without metacognition. It's all metacognition. It's because they, they didn't get grants. They didn't get research funding when they said, I've got a big project on consciousness. People said, oh, consciousness. Nobody will ever understand that. They said, I'm working on metacognition. Ah, that's fantastic. You can have all this money. So it's all now metacognition. But metacognition is about the way we think about and reflect on our own conscious experiences and how much we know about them. So for example, um, metacognition came about with a lot of work on memory. So when you forget somebody's name, you forget the name of an actor, or you forget the name of a song, somebody says, what's, what's, what's the name? You say, oh, hang on, hang on, I know this. So you've got some sort of awareness that you will remember it, and it will come to mind. And that's called a feeling of knowing, right? A feeling of knowing where you think, oh, I, I know this, I'll get this. And very often, it's reliable. If you believe that you're going to get the answer, you will get the answer. So it's a funny sense in which something's just sort of under the, under the radar, below consciousness, but you're metacognitively aware. So this might be what's going on with uh, smell. Might be that people have got a bad link between how well they're aware and what's actually going on. Even though in memory, 
when you're confident that you remember something, that tracks reliability. So very often metacognitive, how we measure metacognitive awareness is by asking for confidence judgments. So somebody says, uh, are these two orders the same? You say, I think so. How confident are you? Mm, about 60%. But if somebody, if somebody here says, oh, I'm 100% confident, it's usually not very reliable. Okay, so we, we measure metacognition by confidence judgments about what you know. So it's not just what you know, but what you know about what you know. That's, the, that's metacognition. So there seems to be a gap between olfactory awareness and olfactory accuracy. Some people are very accurate in their sense of smell, but they don't know it. And other people think they're very accurate, but they're not. Okay, so there's a mismatch. All right. Now, here's back to um, Sobel and Sela, uh, Noam Sobel's group. Awareness in this case refers to the ability of a person to consciously distinguish or detect an olfactory stimulus from the surrounding background. Now, he thinks awareness is the ability to pick out an odor, but that's not awareness, that's accuracy. Somebody may be perfectly good at picking out an odor in the environment without being aware of being able to do that, right? So Sobel's just mixing up accuracy and awareness here. So there could be an ability of a person to register in consciousness an effect of being able to accurately distinguish or detect an odor stimulus from the background and then they might be aware of being able to do that. Some people might be able to do it, and some people might be able to do it and be aware that they're able to do it. And this is what I want to consider. So um, look at coffee tasters and wine tasters versus novices. The Dijon hypothesis, colleagues of mine in Dijon, in Burgundy, in France, have been doing a lot of testing of discrimination where they've got experts and novices and they get them to do discrimination tasks. They don't have to use words. They, they sometimes will put, they'll put five or six glasses on the table and you say you can smell them all and now I want you to sort them into two groups, similar and dissimilar. You know, put all the ones that are similar to one side and all the ones that are different to the other side. Novices are just as good at experts as experts at doing that. They're just as good, but they don't know they are. They often say, oh, I can't do this at all. But when you look at the results, they're fine. Which shows you that at the level of just perceptual equipment, the, the beginner and the expert are not so different in their equipment. But the experts know they can do this. They can do it and they know they can do that. And on that basis, they're able to build more and more ability, okay? So what does it take to be a good smeller? It might be being accurate and then having metacognitive awareness of your accuracy. And when you've got that, now you've got, you, you get some expertise. So the lack in, of confidence in people's ability to discriminate tasks, they still perform well above chance, well above chance, okay? So we need to distinguish olfactory accuracy and olfactory awareness. Okay, so experts and novice wine tasters share similar perceptual discriminative abilities, but there's a metacognitive effect on perception. Um, yeah, let me tell you about this. So again, people say human beings haven't got a good sense of smell, but there is a chemical called, compound called TCA trichloroanisole, which is the, the off smell in a cork. When a wine is corked, when you remove the cork and it smells bad and it contaminates the wine, it makes the wine smell like wet cardboard or a damp cellar. It's really not nice. That's why they give you the cork. They give you it. Now, TCA, we have different thresholds. We've, we've all got different thresholds. But there are some people, there are some people who, can, who can detect three parts per trillion TCA, three parts per trillion. That means you could have three Olympic swimming pools 
and one molecule in one of them, and people could smell and say, that's the one that's got the... I mean, that's an amazing capacity. That's incredible. And also, that's as good as dogs. It's just that dogs can do it at a distance, right? Whereas we need it right under our noses, but, but that's incredible ability. And also, if dogs are so good at smelling at a distance, why do they have to actually smell each other's parts, you know, close by? They could smell it over there. What, what's that? What's up with that? Dogs. Ugh. So we've got this ability, but sometimes you can use your metacognition, even if you can't use your conscious awareness, you can use your metacognition. So I've now learned something in restaurants. So in restaurants, when they pull the cork and they let me taste the wine, sometimes it's just hovering around threshold. But I've learned if I have to even ask the question, is this corked? Then it is. Because if it's not, it just simply doesn't occur. But if I'm puzzled, I think, is that corked? And I'm always annoyed when I say, no, I think it's okay. Usually as the, as the as the evening goes on and more comes out the bottle, it gets stronger and stronger, and then you realize it's there. I usually give it to my female colleagues to taste because quite a lot of them have got a much better sense of smell. Their threshold's much lower, and they go, oh, yeah, it's definitely corked. What's up with you? I, I, I don't know. But I've still got quite a low threshold for that. But I just know that if I even have to question, is that cork? Then it is. So there's a way in which you can use metacognition to bring to attention things that are not there. Now, just going to finish with another piece of thing. So when we're talking about our senses and using our senses, we often think that we're talking about using our external senses, smell and touch and taste and sound and sight and so on. But we've got inside and outside senses. So there's extra reception where you're thinking of things in the world, but there's also interoception. Oops. So interoception matters. As well as perceiving things in the outside world, we get sensations from within. Interoception is the ability to pick up signals from your own bodily state to tell when things have changed in you, changes in your gut changes in your heartbeat, changes in your blood pressure, changes in your musculoskeletal structure, ways in which you've got signals about changes. And those are hugely important indicators of emotion. In fact, emotions are probably just bodily sensations of various kinds. Now, some people are very, very good at detecting their bodily changes. They can tell when something has changed, but they don't necessarily know they can do this. So here's an interesting fact about interoception. So interoception and changes in your bodily state are indicators of emotional change. They can be signals of danger, for example. You can get some register that something is changing before your brain, before the cortex actually catches up and learns about it. So individuals who've got heightened, individuals who've got heightened bodily awareness are often, they feel their emotions more intensely, but they're also better, quicker at recognizing the emotions of others. They pick up on signals much faster. And we can test you to see how good you are. I can't do it properly because we haven't got pulse oximeters to put on your fingers. But let's, let's do the following. We, 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 can, we can just try this. I'm going to ask you to judge how many heartbeats you've had in 30 seconds. So I don't, don't touch your neck or your, just, just, just sit still and tell me. So I'm going to time you, right? So when I say, when I say start, you'll start counting. When I say stop, you'll stop counting. All right. Ready? Start.
stop. Okay, now you've got a number, I hope. Did you find that difficult? Find that difficult to do? Quite difficult? Yeah? Okay. How many people got a number that was in the 30s? How many, two, how many people got a number that was between 25 and 30? Okay. How many people got a number between 20 and 25? Okay. Anybody below 20? Good. <laughs> okay. I think, I think if, you're, if, you've got a normal, if you've got a normal range of heart rate, you would be 40-something. So if you're getting in there, that's probably good. But it's very difficult to do. It's very difficult to do. Now, here's the thing we don't know because we can't use the equipment. I mean, maybe you've got very fast heart rate. What we can do is we can put a pulse oximeter on someone's finger and the computer will have the beep, 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 okay? When you get people to do this task, none of you probably know whether you are accurate or not, but some people are absolutely accurate. They're absolutely spot on. They'll say 43 and it's 43. Incredible, but they don't know, right? So despite not knowing, those of you who are nevertheless accurate without knowing you are, you have found a way maybe of using that signal to give you a jump start, a warning signal that gets you information to the brain fast, to read emotions, to read your own emotions quickly. For example, uh, a study done by Hugo Critchley and Sarah Garfinkel in, in England and in Sussex, they measured uh, stock market traders, people who gamble huge sums of money you know, on the stock market, and they're looking at a bank of screens. There are about you know, 20 screens in front of these guys. And they're, they're looking at all this information. They have to make split-second decisions. Good trade, bad trade. And, you know, now, now, they trade. They trade millions of dollars all the time. They got the records from the London Stock Exchange of the people who had the highest earnings. And then they did the test I've just done with you. But they, met, they wired their hearts to see the people who were most accurate about their heart rate were the ones who were earning the most amount of money. They didn't know they could do that, but it's as if when there's something a little dangerous, this, the heart increases, that signal goes quickly to the amygdala and maybe says, don't, just before they've thought it through, before they're conscious of it. So there's ways in which you're making that reaction. Now, that means there's a gap between interoceptive awareness, sensibility, and accuracy. So accuracy, how accurate were you about your heart rate? Sensibility, what do you think about your accuracy? Do you think you were good at getting that? Do you think you were on it? I mean, there are some people who say, oh, I can do this. There's no, I've got no problem doing that. I can count my heart rate. Go on, try me. And they say, yeah, I've got that. And they're way off. <laughs> So there's a mismatch between two and one. And what we're interested in is interceptive accuracy, which is how well do you do given what you think you can do and what you're actually doing? Is there, is there a reliable match? And I think when people are trained to be better at the sense of smell in perfume, in coffee tasting, in wine tasting and so on, and they're, they're doing something similar, they're using a way of being aware and accurate and bringing them together where most of the time they're far apart. There's even a tempting hypothesis. We haven't tested it yet. Given that sniffing fear single signals from people, smelling the body odor and telling whether someone's afraid, given that that's happening very rapidly and very quick, it might be that people with better interoception are able to process those smells quicker. Here's another lovely part of the heart studies. This is very weird. It turns out that you're more or less accurate at making decisions depending whether you're making them on the heartbeat or between heartbeats. If you're making a perceptual judgment, trying to look at something and figure out visually what's the case, if you make the judgment between heartbeats at diastole, you're more accurate. Snipers can do this. That's when they take their shot, not just because their breathing's in control, that's where they can see better. 
But although heart taking something, making a judgment on the heartbeat at systole, when you are on systole and the heart's beating, although that usually makes you worse at making judgments, when it comes to fear, you're better. A lovely study, again, by Garfinkel and uh, uh, Critchley, you time lock the presentation of stimuli to systole, to when the heart's pulsing. And when they're fear signals, fearful stimuli, fearful faces, people are quicker and more accurate at recognizing fear stimuli when it's at systole, when the heart's beating, than when it's between heartbeats. And if you think of it, when you're afraid, your heart beats faster, so you have more systole, so you're better able to detect fear signals, quicker able to do it. And that might also be true for smell. It might be that when you're, when you're smelling fear signals, you're better at systole, but when you're trying to sample odors and remember them, you might be better to do that at diastole which is probably why wine tasters and coffee tasters take a long time, and they're very quiet, very still, finding that moment. Okay, so, does olfaction get switched off in the gaps? I'm just gonna leave you with this final example. Have you noticed that your home doesn't seem to have a smell? When you go home, you're, you're your place that you stay, your apartment, your house, doesn't have a smell. Everybody else's apartment's got a smell. How come yours hasn't? Well, of course yours has. It's just you don't pay attention to it anymore. And so some people will say, so it's switched off. Nothing has changed. So the brain says, don't pay any attention, don't waste any resources, just turn it off. Whereas when you go into a new place, you can smell. Now, when you've been away for a month and you go back to your own home, you can smell it. You're like, oh, that's what it smells like. But, but usually you don't. Now, the question is, is it the case that you're not smelling your home or are you just not attending to it? And I think there is a difference. Because although you say, I can't smell the smell of my own home, you could smell if somebody had been in there you could smell if somebody had been smoking. You could smell if you left the garbage out. You would be onto that straight away, very fast. Which means that you're maintaining a baseline against which you judge has something changed. And so, this may be what smell's all about. Your sense of smell might be most important for telling you when something changes in the environment. If everything is the same, you don't need to pay attention to it, rather like the air conditioning. It doesn't mean it goes unconscious, you just don't pay attention. But when something has changed, then of course you probably do want to pay attention to it. Okay, so I also, also want to tell you that people who lose their sense of smell, people who've lost their sense of smell, they say they feel alienated from their own home. Their own home doesn't feel familiar, doesn't feel safe, doesn't feel like theirs anymore. And when that happens, that shows you there's a difference between not smelling at all and smelling but not paying much attention to it. Because if it's, if it's not there, it feels quite different. It feels entirely different. All right. So I'm going to go for option A. I think we do have olfaction, but I think it's not noticed or recognized. And therefore, I think our sense of smell is always there, but it's a constant background to experience. And because it's so constant, we don't notice it unless it changes, unless there's something vastly different. So the final thing is, there's a difference between orthonasal and retronasal smell. Retronasal olfaction is, we don't recognize that it's smell, but it is. And habituation to our own homes, to familiar odors, doesn't mean we stop smelling, it just means nothing's changed, so we don't pay attention. Thank you.
Okay. Yes. Do you want to sit there? Yeah. I feel I should sing my way or something when I do this. And now the end, isn't it? <laughs> Please. Uh, okay, you feel free to, to ask uh, questions to Barry. We, we, have, we should have now an informal uh, dialogue or something. Informal. informal, so you can ask and answer also, reply to Barry if you want. So it's not, uh, it shouldn't be a f formal questions. We should try to really establish some dialogue here. Should we uh, just hug? Yeah, just, just hug, hug maybe. <laughs> Smell, maybe. <laughs> okay, and okay. who wants to start here? I, I can let, let me to, ask you, let me ask okay. you the question I asked at the beginning. Do you think there are many words in Portuguese for smells. Have you thought of how many words there are, not for strawberry raspberry, not for fruit or flowers, but just for quality of smells? Are there some? Any? Must be some. What about a burning smell? Or what about a fatty smell? Or what about a, a smell of something which is uh, rotten, decay? Yeah, you must have words for those. I'm sure you've got words for them. If you say them, Sophia will recognize them. <laughs> um, yeah, I use many, but I, I really use more ostension than, than words in the sense that, or comparison. This is a smell it's different from a smell of rotten eggs. It's different from a smell of rotten meat. It's something in between. Or, or, or but if you say rotten, that's, that's about the smell, right? It's I, not about the source. It's about uh, the smell, I think. No? But, okay. I'm always interested in, in, your, in, in you in the source of it. <laughs> So it's where it comes from. Yeah. Um, I, w I wanted to ask you about um, the difference between uh, the, the concepts of proprioception and interoception. I think proprioception is uh, so pro general. Right. So proprioception is just awareness of where our limbs are in space. So if you close your eyes now, you know where your hands are, where your feet are, where your arms and legs are, without having to look or touch them. That's proprioception. But interoception is this awareness of internal bodily change. Mm. Butterflies in the stomach, we say, that feeling of excitement. Changes in your heart rate, stiffening of your skeletal structure. Mm -hmm. All of that. That's interoception. How many of you? How many of you are aware of those things? How many of you feel you're very aware of those changes inside? Well, I, I would love to to hear something more about the relationship between interoception and self-awareness or yeah. self-consciousness, because uh, normally we think about self-conscious like a, a non-bodily. <laughs> non-bodily uh, uh, capacity, but uh, I think is, is, is that there is a, a great uh, uh, correlation between uh, the absence of interoception and some absence, uh, absence of uh, yeah. self-consciousness, uh, uh, or awareness of... So, so a lot of people, yeah, it used to be when I wrote the book that, or yeah. contributed to the book that Sophia was yeah. showing, it was very much about how we know our own minds, thinking of something purely mental. Yeah. How, do we, how are we self-aware? But a lot of our conception of ourselves as a self is bodily awareness, where I am, of course. Where, I, where I look from, where my eyes are pointing. 
the information I'm getting now about being in this skin. And interoception is now, a lot of people are using interoception to think of uh, theories of self-consciousness. So for example, I think we're going to hear about this uh, next week, predictive, predictive processing in the brain, the Bayesian brain is very popular, the idea that we predict the sensations we're going to have and then we confirm whether they're true. Now, if we're able to predict what our internal states will be like in the next minute or two or a few seconds, if we get information that says, yeah, that's how it feels, then you, that helps you think, that's me. If that was missing, if we were so disembodied, yeah. we might not feel as though it was ourselves. We might actually feel uh, a lack of a sense of self and the lack of a sense of reality. Okay. I, I think it's possible to rewrite the second uh, meditation of the card I, I with, think so. with yeah. this information. That's, that's right. That's right. I think that's right. I think that's right. I, I wanted to say. So. Okay. Okay. No, just about the discussion. Uh, I have this problem, but just a contribution. Uh, to, to distinguish between words for interception and words for emotions, for example. Yeah. Uh, I, I see some overlapping between this, the names we use for identification of some interception pro processes and some emotional processes. Isn't that right? Well, a lot of people believe that emotions and interoception... A lot of people believe emotions and interoception are very closely linked. So, if you have William James's theory of emotion. So, James thought that an emotion was the perception of a change in your bodily state. So, he said, when I start to run away, I don't run away because I'm scared. It's because I'm running away that I know I'm scared. That, that the body starts moving and acting. And when you're aware of that change, that's, that's the perception of emotion. So for example, I mean, James says, if you take being angry and you take away the increase in blood pressure, the stiffening of the muscles, the change in the face, if you took all of that away, where's the anger? You know, he thinks you need to have those bodily changes to identify an, an emotion. And what's also interesting is the heart. We now know the heart has got different cardiac signatures for different emotions. Not exactly, but some big changes. You don't have a constant heart rhythm. It changes a lot. And in fact, people who've got a very constant heart rhythm the people who do, the population who do, are schizophrenics. We don't know why, but schizophrenics have a very regular heart rate, very regular. So you don't want that. When your heart rate is quite variable, that also reflects some emotional and mood differences. For example, we know there's a very strong cardiac signature for anticipation. Anticipation, the heart, the heart rate increases and then falls slowly and then oscillates. And we were trying, to, we were interested in the following hypothesis. There are TV jingles or advertising jingles which do that. Mm -hmm. And they're some of the most successful. And you wonder whether they get you to anticipate what's about to happen. Because the heart gets entrained by music. When you're listening to music, your heart rate st starts to synchronized to the music. So when people are listening to music together, they'll actually synchronize with one another. And of course, musicians know this, the moment when everybody feels like one, then it's sort of special. But we now know some of the mechanism for doing that. So I think a lot of emotion is regulated by, by both heart changes in rhythm and interoceptive awareness of that, or interoceptive accuracy about that. You're not necessarily aware of it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, does the smell has a relation with our perception of friend or foe uh, with others? Uh, 
uh, does it? <laughs> Interception? Uh, no, I mean the smell, the sense yeah. of smell yeah, ha yeah, yeah. Uh, has a relation with our perception of friend or foe. Yes. Um, Friend and foe, yes, and I don't know whether you were here, because I know you guys had to come late, but were you here when we talked about how you, you choose your partner uh, by how they smell? Um, it turns out that you prefer, you're more attracted to people whose sense of smell indicates that their immune system is far away from yours. If their immune system is too close, you, you, you don't have that attraction, which is probably important for siblings. Um, and that suggests that we're kind of biologically attuned to find people whose major histocompatibility complex is different from ours to improve the chances of breeding and being immune to disease and so on. And, and I was suggesting that sometimes you have love at first smell instead of love at first sight you might suddenly find someone very, they were great, I, they were just so lovely, and you don't know why, but it might be for that reason. So I think smell's having this effect. Also, you can, because you can smell fear, and it turns out you can distinguish, if, if you get an experiment done by uh, Denise Chen and, uh, and others, you get people to wear T-shirts when they're going through some very fearful experience, and other people when they're going through some thrilling, exciting experience, just by smelling the t-shirts and being forced to say excited or afraid, people are very good at doing that. They don't know how they do it, but they do it. They don't even know if they're right, but they're, they're accurate. So yes, chemical signaling between human beings, hugely important, and we use it a lot. Plus you can recognize uh, your own family members by the smell of their clothes. Thank you. Anyone? Okay. <laughs> Barry, do you talk? You talked about the the case that people say that their homes don't smell the same anymore, or they don't smell at all. Uh, and you talked about a baseline. Yeah. Uh, this is because. Uh, we are f familiar with the smell, so we have certain says conscious of it, consciousness of it. But uh, when we lose the ability to smell, we will miss something. Yes. So in a certain sense, we are conscious. Like I am conscious of the noise of the air conditioner, yeah. and I will only only notice when it stops. Yeah. So uh, this is a confusion that they are making uh, about consciousness and attention. Yes. I think that's right. I think it's about consciousness and attention. Now, of course, famously, some people think attention is necessary for consciousness or even that it constitutes consciousness when you're attending to something that that's what makes it conscious. And I don't believe that. I think you've got consciousness without attention. Um, so, for example, if I get you now, all of you now, to think about the sensations you have in your right foot. Just think of the sensations you're having in your right foot. I bet you feel them now, okay? And they're probably much more intense, but the question is, were they always there and you didn't notice? Or, or did it only become conscious when you thought about it? That's a very hard question to answer. A lot of people are interested and it's hard to answer it, but, but it's a good question because it seems to make sense that it's one or the other. But here's the, here's the point about the home, yes. So you've got this baseline and you recognize things have changed, but what people don't realize is when they walk into their own home, they have a feeling of well-being and familiarity that's quite emotionally reassuring. And when people lose their sense of smell, that's what they lose and they often say, I feel cut off from my own home. I feel as though I'm behind glass. I don't feel I belong. It doesn't feel like my home anymore. And also, it's interesting, nobody's looked at this, but um, Capgras syndrome. So Capgras syndrome, neurological condition where people say, that's not my wife. It looks just like my wife, but it's not her. It's, she's been replaced by an imposter who looks just the same. 
Now, some people say it's because your visual system is not sending the information to the emotional centers to give you the same emotional significance. Nobody tested them to see whether their sense of smell is the same. Because, of course, if they're not getting any emotional input to the amygdala from smell, then again, that might be another reason for thinking it can't be them, because it just doesn't feel right. So absence of, absence of smell has negative emotional effects. It doesn't take you to neutral. It's negative. So that's why I think it's not an absence of smell. It's just an absence of um, attention to smell. But somebody could equally argue, no, all that you're able to show is that smell is still working and has that emotional effect on consciousness, but it doesn't itself appear in consciousness, and that's very difficult to decide. Thank you. Oh, another question at the back. Anna? Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> it was uh, continuing my former question. Um, it's about uh, phenomeno f pheno Phenomenolo the phenomenology of yeah. um, emotions or, yeah. or smell. Or, in the sense that if uh, emotions are linked to interception, yes, okay. So, but the phenomenology of emotions would be different from interception uh, of in, uh, perception in the sense of interception, perception of something interior, right. no? Well, or, or no? So, so, so I think emotions, emotions are a subset of the things we have interoceptive awareness of. So, for example, when you're coming up with a theory of the emotions, you've got to be able to explain what makes something an emotion rather than just be a mere feeling. And I always have in mind the feeling of nausea you have in a car sometimes. Now, that's not an emotion, right? But it's got lots of the features. It's bodily awareness. It's got some behavioral consequences. It's got negative hedonics. You want it to stop and so on. But it's not an emotion. So, so emotions are a subset of the set of things you can be aware of internally. So interoception, I think, is important for emotions, but it's important for a larger range of states too. So you are, you are not distinguishing between the perception and some other no. kinds of phenomenology? No. No. Logical I mean, the, I think description it, or Well, something. I think the perception, the perception is bound up with the phenomenology in the case of interoception. You feel these things. So this is, this is a very, you know, our emotions are embodied. So this is an embodied mind, embodied emotion view. If you think, it's very interesting that the, the chief uh, cognitivist about the emotions, Robert Solomon, who, had, who was very good at making a case for emotions being cognitive. Um, he said, I've been criticized for leaving out an account of uh, the body and just talking about judgments, emotions as judgments. And he said, now I want to fix that. And he said, no doubt my critics will laugh, but I want to call these bodily feelings judgments of the body. It's very good. It's so a way in which you know from how you're reacting, how you feel, right? And you're, you're getting information that's useful, I think. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm not yet sure how I'm going to formulate a question because it's quite long, but uh, it, ha it is something I thought of when you, you were talking about uh, heartbeat and the relations um, about in the, schizophrenia, uh, the schizophrenia relation to the heartbeat being constant. Yes. Uh, so I was thinking, there's, there's uh, an experiment, or not just one experiment, but if you, I read once that you can make an experiment where you will place uh, someone, in, uh, you cut, like, 
you isolate one of the sensory, uh, sensory perceptions of a, of a person, like staring to a blank screen for a very long time, you start uh, seeing things in it. Yes. So, uh, could the relation uh, and our hearts uh, change, the heartbeat changes as you are interacting with the world, right? So it goes faster or it gets slower. So the constant heartbeat would mean, uh, in a schizophrenic person, would mean that it is not really uh, responding to the environment. Yeah. And so would the feelings they get, like the paranoias and stuff, be like the hallucinations you get from staring to a blank screen? That's a very, very good question. And, and a lot of people now believe that we should try to understand schizophrenia as more like cases of um, hallucination or, or, or even, instead of just thinking of them as delusions, thinking of them as more like hallucinations where you're getting the wrong inputs. If, you're, if your heart rate is constant, even though things in the world and people interacting with you are always changing, you're not getting enough information either about what's going on there or you. And, and you may have to start generating hypotheses yourself. So you're relying much more on how you're trying to figure things out. And we know that they're hyperactive, hypervigilant in their beliefs and in thinking, and they, they create all sorts of explanations. But this may be replacing what we would intuitively get, which was more accurate. You know, people say, I have an odd feeling, I don't, I don't feel comfortable here, or I think we should go, it's a bit dangerous. So they, they listen to that, they pick it up. But if you don't have that information, you have to think about everything that might be happening. And also, you're right that the lack of feedback may make you generate something like hallucinatory uh, experiences and emotions. How they would be felt, though, without the change is the difficulty to try and explain the difficulty. But it, it does look like it's highly cognitive. Very often, the brain is just working far too much and far too fast, making too many connections, as if, as if without having the feelings to rely on, you're doing too much cognitive work. So I think, I think you're right. I mean, I think that's Chris Frith, my colleague, uh, neuroscientist in London, who's, who's quite an expert on schizophrenia, he, he, he's, he has that, something of that view. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Questions? I think you're probably exhausted because you've been doing <laughs> you've been doing English now constantly for a long time. It's, it's a lot. Yeah. Okay. Curiosity, no? Oh, if if there is no other, oh, okay, Gabriel. Uh, I was curious about how smell and vision, they compete in attention. Yeah. Uh, because we are always seeing, but the, the smell of something rot, yes, if we don't see the cause of the smell, we are, got, we are going to be attention of, about it. But if we see the uh, corpse, yeah. uh, they compete between the indentation, our vision is priority to the brain. So that's a very interesting question too, because your senses have to be calibrated with one another. And, and there's all, often a recalibration depending on which sort of environment you're in. So if you're in a bright light environment and you can see everything, you'll trust your eyes and your eyes will dominate. But if you're in a dark street with no lighting, can hardly see, you're gonna trust your ears. Somebody's behind me, what's that noise? So you, you do a bit of changing. But, but they don't always compete, sometimes they collaborate because uh, vision will give you uh, an expectation about what you're going to smell. If you see someone at a distance cutting a pineapple, 
you already know what to expect as you get nearer and you get the odor. But if I give you the smell of pineapple in a little bottle with no, no shape of a pineapple, it's very hard. You, you, people are not good. And I think the reason why they're not good at identifying smells is because usually a smell comes from an object with a shape and a color and a size and a feel, like a pineapple. And not only are you not getting that helpful visual tactile information to go with the smell, you're getting counter information. Your, your brain is telling you it's a liquid, it's clear. That's not a pineapple. No wonder it's so difficult to say, what is that, what is that? So, so, so I think they, they sometimes collaborate. And not only that, smells can be more intense when you look at the color of something that's got the right color for the way. When you look at an orange, if you look at an orange like a black and white photograph, it won't intensify. If you look at an orange, really the color, that can intensify the sense of smell you get when, when presented with the odor. So they sometimes work together in that way. Similarly, if you go into a house and it's being painted, you can recognize the smell of fresh paint immediately. If you're in a, 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 a mill where they're sawing wood, you can recognize the smell of sawdust. But if I give you them with no clue, no visual clue, you're probably not going to get them. So if there is no questions at the moment, we will interrupt our talk for some hours. I thank you very much, Barry, for your talk and uh, for the details that I didn't know and many of us didn't know. And we will um, start again at half past seven today with uh, the second talk of the day about Art. The multi-sensory perception of art. The multi-sensory uh, perception of art. I invite you all to be present at half past seven again. Okay? So, thank you very much. And thanks to all of you. Thank you very much.